Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is Seeking Sustainability Live. I'm your host, JJ Walsh, here in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I'm talking with journalist, writer John Lettman, who is in Hawaii right now. John Lettman is an independent journalist based on the island of Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. He writes about people, politics, and the environment with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. Today we're talking about his articles with topics from nuclear bombs and testing, as well as indigenous rights, indigenous people, culture, traditions, and environmentalism, and how that's really all connected beyond political borders. Thanks so much for joining, John. Hi, thanks for having me, Joy. It's nice to be with you. And we've been connected on Twitter for a long time. Um, and then it just seemed great to be able to connect with you on this talk show. And although it's not all about uh, Japan and connections to Japanese culture or Japanese sustainability, of course, there are so many connections in what we are talking about. Um, because of your brilliant articles, you've been focused on、uh, military politics, indigenous rights. How did you get interested in the kinds of topics that you cover for your articles? Well,、um, I suppose that a lot of it came from just life experiences, but moving, I, you know, I used to live in Japan in the 90s, I was living in Osaka for about nine years. And、uh, my wife and I moved from Japan to Hawaii in、uh, April of 2001. And when we moved to Hawaii, gradually over the course of a few years, as I became to and, and see how things operate here and, and what priorities are here in terms of、uh, the economy, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of how the land is used, I Gradually became more aware of the struggle between, for example, Hawaiian and、um, indigenous rights and lifestyles and economic situations and development and the、uh, widespread militarism or the military presence here in Hawaii. And then I, I kind of saw how that was playing out in other places, for example, of course, in Japan, in Okinawa. In South Korea. And then gradually I just learned more about、um, what was happening around the Pacific in Micronesia, specifically the Marshall Islands. And then I learned more about what was going on in Guam. And I, I, as I learned more about this, I, I just kept hearing some of the same things being repeated in different places. And it just made me ask a lot of questions. And so I started to dig in and, and I thought, oh, this is. Interesting and it's important, and I think it's kind of underreported. And so I, I thought I want to learn more about this, and I want hopefully other people to maybe take an interest in these issues and, and see how their lives may be affected, even if they're not aware of it. Yeah, definitely.、Um, in your articles,、uh, I notice you have talked with Bo Jacobs. Who is a local historian, professor in the Hiroshima area?、Uh, you have also、uh, talked about Peace Boat. They have also, we had a representative from Peace Boat talking in the series.、Um, there's a lot of connections in your articles to Hiroshima. And you did a really interesting article last year、um, talking with Satoko, is it? Satoko. Satoko, Satoko Thurlow. Mm -hmm. And then、uh, you also did a conversation this year with a journalist who is writing about John Hershey's book. And、mm -hmm. uh, could you just talk a little bit about those two? About, about the interview with、um, Leslie Bloom? Yes. So, Leslie Bloom, who's pictured on the screen, the black and white photo, the headshot, is an author of a book、uh, called Fallout. And Leslie, Her、uh, Leslie Bloom、um, researched John Hersey, the、uh, reporter who was working for Time 
and then he went over to the New Yorker. This is during the Second World War, and he covered all different aspects of the war, including um, battles between the U.S. and the Japanese in the Solomon Islands. And then eventually, after the bombing of Hiroshima, John Hersey and his editors decided they wanted to get back. Uh, they wanted to get him in there, into the city. As you know, it was um, very difficult for people to get in, especially for foreign reporters. The U.S. military had control and wanted to control the narrative. And so this um, author, Leslie Bloom, pictured on the screen there, she wrote this book about how he went in and how he kind of cracked open this story that was really quite hidden. That you know, And he, he wrote this incredible 30,000-word book expose about you know i'm sure you're obviously familiar with the book um hiroshima by john hersey um that was originally a single article it was one long thirty thousand word article which um took up the entirety of i think it was the august 31st 1946 issue of the new yorker magazine so anyway um leslie bloom's book fallout which came out last year on the anniversary of the bombing August 6th, um, she wrote about his work. And, and I read her book, and I'd heard some of the media interviews she did, and I was very interested in the, in the subject and her take on it and the way she covered it. And, you know, I, I'd read Hiroshima in the past, and I I'd, I'd actually hadn't thought about it for a long time. And then I did a – this is getting off the subject a little bit – but I did a, um, a workshop in, on Oahu in Hawaii, in uh, January 2019, it was called um, "This Is Not a Drill," based on the, um, the the ballistic missile scare we had in 2018. I think January 2018. Anyway, so there was this nuclear weapons and journalism workshop, and having done that, I became more interested in in learning more and writing more about nuclear weapons. And having heard this um, woman, Leslie Bloom write this book and having read the book and being really impressed. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. Um, I, I thought I want to talk to her and I want to talk to her about her book, but I also want to talk to her because she's like a, like a journalist journalist. She's from a journalist background. She's married to a journalist. Her father was a journalist. She's like really into journalism. And so I thought, let's talk. I wanted to have a conversation with her about how nuclear weapons are covered or how they're not covered. And so we had an interview. We did it the way you and I are speaking on Skype or whatever we used, Zoom, um, in July of this, so last month. And uh, we, had, we had a pretty good long talk. And um, then I, you know, cut it down and narrated, it, um, edited the article. And it was ran in a website called Inkstick Media, which uh, you can link to, or it's, it's easy enough to find. But anyway, um, this writer, Leslie Bloom, uh, had just a lot of really interesting and important insights, I thought, into the way nuclear weapons are and are not covered and, and how they should be covered and the challenges with, obviously, with climate emergency, with COVID, with just ongoing crises, economic, you name it. You, I mean, you it's all there every day. Yeah, so, it was really interesting. And yeah. you you connected the timing of her book was she really wanted to come out last year at the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. Um, but it was also very interesting timing because it was kind of during the time when the Trump administration was talking about restarting nuclear testing and how he right. really wanted to get back into the testing. And you've done a lot of interesting articles also on testing. And it brings me to your article with Setsuko Thurlow and a lot of parallels between Leslie Bloom and Setsuko Thurlow articles in they're talking about the idea of a nuclear bomb, the idea of a nuclear test, and then the reality for the people who are under the cloud is very different. And it's it's changing the narrative, like she was talking about in the biography. Hershey was the first to change the narrative 
to start talking about the people who sure. struggled after the bomb, right? Who survived or didn't survive. So really interesting insights there. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. It's, just, it's, you know, all too often the most important element of, of these stories, which is the impact, at least from a human perspective, is, is human beings. Um, gets left out or it's overlooked or it's overshadowed or the narrative is spun in such a way that it's, that just is thrown out. And and so talking to someone like Leslie Bloom or talking to Stetsuko Thurlow, who I'm sure some of your viewers are familiar with her. She's a very well-known Hibakusha. Um, she was there in Hiroshima on August 6th. So speaking with her and speaking with other people, like from, I spoke, spoke with some other Hibakusha who were on Peace Boat. And that was another piece I wrote uh, like a year or two earlier. Anyway, just talking with them and, and bringing it back to, you know, let's bring it, you know, we talk about deterrence, we can talk about, you know, strategic goals, we can talk about all these other things, but let's talk about the people. And then that that brings, that brought me anyway, and hopefully brings other people to thinking about the the, the unseen and the often overlooked aspects of the cost of nuclear weapons, which is on full display in the Marshall Islands or in Kazakhstan or in parts of the United States, um, in Kiribati, in the Pacific, of course, in Algeria um, and other parts of the Pacific where the French tested. So there's ample evidence of, you know, the cost of these weapons in terms of human suffering. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, something I think is important to cover. Definitely. And the, the whole um, concept of the testing is, is really, it's just shocking. And I think a lot of people don't realize that after the war was over, starting from 1945, like you talk about in this article I'm showing on screen, um, in the Marshall Islands, they did 67 nuclear weapons tests over 12 years after mm -hmm. the war. Yeah, from and 1946 to 58, yeah. Amazing. And so many local people were displaced from their islands, uh, poisoned from the effects. There's also a lot of veterans who were not compensated and in the UK and other countries are trying to at least get the government to say what happened is true and we're sorry. Like just that level of accountability has not been achieved yet. It's just right, incredible. Right. So it's it's not like it was just Hiroshima and Nagasaki and then it was finished. There is a lot of suffering after because of the testing, which it sounds, even the word testing sounds harmless, but it's far from harmless. Sure, sure. The, the the impacts of those tests in the Marshall Islands, for example, in the 40s and 50s are still felt today in terms of high levels of, of cancer, uh, the displacement, the dislocation, the uh, being torn away from your culture and your, you know, your environment and just a, a massive change. Um, and it, it's on nuclear bombs are not being exploded today. Um, by the U.S. And, and Russia, for example, um, the delivery systems are are ongoing. So the U.S. is still testing Minuteman three ICBMs, firing them from Vandenberg Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, flying them to Kwajalein Atoll um, in the Marshall Islands. So they're not testing the explosive, but they're testing the delivery mechanism, and that's ongoing. It's uh, pretty amazing. Um, here on Kauai, where I live, which is a small island, a small, as you know, it's a small Hawaiian island, 73,000 people. We have a military base, and Sandia National Laboratories has um, what they call the Kauai, uh, what's it called? Kauai Test Site. K I think it's KT, uh, Kauai Test Facility, excuse me, Kauai Test Facility, where they're doing what they call sounding uh, rocket tests, where they're, they're testing components of future systems for delivering nuclear weapons. And this kind of stuff goes on and it gets virtually no attention. It's happening. People don't really talk about it. They're not really aware of it. And yet it's going on right 
in our backyards. That's incredible. And for anybody who's ever visited Hawaii, you know how beautiful these islands are. And Kauai, where you are, John, in particular, is just stunning. It was used as the setting for Jurassic Park. It is what our ancient <laughs> lands used to look like, right? It's it's so mm -hmm. pristine, yet the U.S. Navy or the, the military in general is creating a lot of pollution um, and noise. Uh, there's a lot of gap between what the military is allowed to do and what the local indigenous culture or even local residents are allowed to say it's infringing on their rights to a quality of life, right? And then mm -hmm, we talked mm -hmm, before mm -hmm. we started, there's also big business there like uh, pharmaceuticals or chemical companies who are also active in these beautiful places. So I think a lot of people around the world don't realize how interconnected so much of the Hawaiian islands is with the military. All right. And, you know, living here and, and seeing these things and, and keeping track and following what's going on. Um, and then to take it to Japan or take it to Okinawa and then to visit, uh, I was in Okinawa second visit in 2015 to see what's happening there. It's just like another level. So you take what's happening in Hawaii and you amplify it, and you magnify it, and you, in fact, it's not a word, but worsify it. You make it worse, um, from my perspective anyway. Um, you go to Okinawa and you see what's happening there. It's, it's mind-blowing in terms of the militarization, the threat to, for example, Oura Bay, Henoko, probably familiar with that, um, Yambaru Forest in northern Okinawan Island and elsewhere. You know, other islands have been militarized by Japan and by the U.S. So it's yeah, it's 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 so uh, widespread, it's vast, it's ongoing, and it's not only limited to obviously Okinawa and Hawaii, Guam, the Marshall Islands, and other places now too. Are you know, the U.S. is in talks with uh, the Federated States of Micronesia (FSM). Uh, they're in talks with Palau. Um, there's interest. Um, it's not only necessarily the U.S., um, but there's interest in. Usually, it's you know, it's the military and it's politicians and other interests who who want to develop uh, this uh, relationship in in military terms, always with an eye on China and to a lesser extent North Korea. Yeah, and there's always there's like a bigger um, picture. Uh, conversation. The reason to do it is always progress or security. But I think it was your interview with Setsuko Thurlow and then again with um, Leslie Bloom talking about if you think about all the money that is being used for, for testing, which is displacing people and disadvantaging so many people, uh, especially marginalized communities or people who are less in the media as people we care about who we want to help is that all that money could be used in fighting climate change and right. you know giving people better health care and education it's just an insane amount of money right. in japan yeah. in america in uk in europe you know all around the yeah. world Amazing. Yeah, it, it can be. Uh, it's pretty disheartening what um, what our priorities are. I mean, just look at the front, you know, page of the newspaper this morning with the collapse of the government in Afghanistan and the Taliban just rushing across. You know, twenty years the U.S. has been there and, and leaves, and you know, so yeah, there's there's a, a lot of uh, opportunity for improvement. Definitely. Um, so we mentioned before in one of your articles, you're talking about the cloud of ignorance. So people not understanding what indigenous or local communities go through under the testing cloud of nuclear weapons or under the Hiroshima cloud or Nagasaki cloud. Um, but also you covered a very interesting uh, kind of event in Hawaii years ago, 2016, 
where indigenous groups from around Asia, Africa, and the Americas were brought together. And one of the things from your article really stood out to me. Uh, one of the delegates was saying, by uniting, we could be much better able to convey our message together across these arbitrary political boundaries. And that stood out to me so much because, you know, this is something we've seen for the COVID crisis, for climate change. Uh, you know, COVID is not stopping at the political boundaries. Climate change is, is not stopping. So this idea from the indigenous communities that our problems with the world, environment, culture, traditions, land, politics, it's not boundary. It's it's boundless, boundaryless, right? And that right. was so poignant. I love that. Who rem rem yeah, I remember that, but I, who said that? I don't remember. Oh, it's so small on my screen. I'm so sorry. Is it, yeah, um, I can't see it either. But it I was, no, I remember the quote. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And there were yeah. delegates from Borneo and uh, talking about right. de deforestation. And, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in Japan, when you have a house rebuilt like we did and you you ask for, you know, where is your wood coming from? Quite often they'll say it's different parts of Asia. And you're like, well, yeah. is it forest Malaysia. safe? Yeah. Are you sure it's from sustainable forests? You know, like there's no checking happening on right. this side or in many rich countries. And this devastation of forests, the quick plantations for palm oil, um, damming in a lot of these places, all the things Mining, you, yeah. you talk about. And, and it's separating the people, the local people from their land which they feel very strongly is essential for practicing their culture and traditions. And right. medicine, you know, everything comes from their connection to the environment. And I think now we're looking at these examples and thinking they're right. And I hope it's not too late, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, um... The article you're referencing in the event was the is the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is um, I think established in 1964, um, and they have every three years they have this World Conservation Congress, which it was in Jeju in 2013, Jeju Island, South Korea, um, and there was some controversy there with the militarization of that island, and then three years later, for the first time ever in the United States. It uh, was held here in Hawaii, um, and I was fortunate enough to attend that. It was an incredible event, and it was even more incredible now because of COVID, because now where we can't even get together with 20 people, there you had thousands of people from, I think it was 190 countries. It was pretty much every country but two or three, <clears throat> and you had those the, the folks that I met. I, was, I, had, I had people that I knew I was able to get in touch with, people from Siberia, from, um, uh, I think, Kyrgyzstan, Borneo, um, and, and elsewhere in, in talking about these issues. So yeah, it's, uh, it's great when you're able to meet these people and, and find the, the common ground that, you know, that we all share as humans, and then also hear the stories and the, the challenges that they're facing, and then um, hear how other people are around the world are facing similar issues. And, and you just start to hear the same thing again and again. It's obviously it's a little different depending on the circumstances, but it's, it's the same thing. It's, you know, having, being able to have access and have clean air, clean water, a place to grow food, a place to live safely, a place to live free of, of harm, free of pollution, um, free of uh, violence. I mean, Anyone who's in, yeah, there they go. Those guys are from Papua New Guinea, uh, Manang province, the two of them. And they were great. They were, you know, fascinating. They're, they're, one of their big challenges um, was mining. Uh, Papua New Guinea, um, like other parts of Asia, mining is a huge thing. And it's, it's the same old thing. It's the, it's the big rich countries. It's the, the Chinas, the, the Canadas, uh, the United States, uh, European powers, Australia. 
that are going in and, you know, whether it's the Philippines or Papua New Guinea or, or elsewhere, um, it's, uh, it's a threat to the way these people lived, have lived and want to live. And it's, it comes down to money and it comes down to greed and it comes down to who has the power and who doesn't. Uh, let's continue. So we were talking about uh, indigenous people at this amazing conference in Hawaii in 2016, where people were brought from all over Asia and Africa and the Americas to Hawaii to discuss some of the common issues that they were having. And uh, this idea of giving back rights to indigenous people for their land, which you talk about in your articles so beautifully, is also very connected to conservation in many ways. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. I mean, you know, the the um, event you're talking about is the World Conservation Congress, the IUCN World Conservation Congress held every uh, three years, I believe. Um, in fact, it's going to actually convene next month in Nice, in France. Um, it was postponed one year because of COVID, but it's supposedly going to happen next month. But yeah, the one in, Oa in Honolulu um, in 2016 was an opportunity for people from, as you said, all over the world to come and just look at um, issues related to conservation and, and uh, preservation and, and threats to, to the environment on every level, from the ocean to the land to the air, um, to wildlife, to plants. Um, so you, you had people coming from all over the world to, uh, you know, just, it was kind, it's kind of a, a, an opportunity for people to get to know other people and, and, and learn about issues that, you know, that may overlap with their own, whatever their own focus is on. Um, and that's what it was for me. I mean, you know, as a reporter covering this, it was a great opportunity. You see some of the people on the screen there. Um, who'd come from Siberia, and they come from um, East Africa, from uh, uh, parts of Kenya um, and Papua New Guinea, and to exchange ideas and, and to all, not just exchange ideas, but to come up with strategies for, you know, what's, how can we actually, what are concrete steps that can be taken at different levels, on the government level, the, the non-government level, um, individual level, uh, organizationally, and how can people collaborate and, and what can be done to stop the threats to the environment, whether it's the land or the water and so forth. So uh, just an extraordinary meeting. Um, and it was a, a great opportunity for me to, to hear um, these folks that are on the screen you see here from Papua New Guinea and um, Daniel, the, the guy at the top of the blue, was from Siberia, um, to hear what they're dealing with and and uh, just for me as a reporter, just to raise awareness of, of you know, people, this is, these are the kind of people that are generally not in the evening news, right? We're talking about the same six or seven issues. And as important as they are, there's so many other things that are happening, as we all know, in the world, which just often get overlooked. And, and you know, I think it's, it's important to kind of include these things, too. Definitely. And a lot of the, um, there was a, a member of the UN, you had a quote from in the article saying that a lot of the best uh, areas which have been conserved are areas around the world, which the rights, the land rights and the development rights have been given back to indigenous people. And of course, there is some cases where it's very interesting, but once the indigenous people were given back the rights, sometimes conservation did not happen because they were also swayed by a way to make money. Uh, having a casino or building mines was a way for them to make money too. But for the most part, um, there was a lot more conservation happening than when uh, other parties came in and took control. And don't we see this all the time with, with nature, basically? Uh, there is a, a great book um, written by Fukuoka Sensei in Japan, uh, where One Straw Revolution, where he talks about 
humans, mankind, we are so arrogant. We come in and we think we know better than nature and we try to take over and control nature. And I see so many parallels to what we're doing with indigenous people, trying to say, we know better than you, even though your traditions, your culture lasts thousands of years and ours is relatively new. So having a more humble approach, giving indigenous people the rights and the equality that they deserve to mm -hmm. take control of their own lands um, is definitely a more sustainable future. You, you outlined this so beautifully in your articles. Yeah. Um, well, that was that kind of ties into, and I, I was talking about this when I was by myself. So I'll, I don't know if anyone heard it or not, but the Vanuatu article, you, you said keep talking about it, and I did. But that ties in with what you're saying right now. Um, and, you know, this, uh, this struggle to, for, people from the outside to come into a, a foreign environment and, um, you know, what kind of approach do they take um, in terms of uh, exchanging ideas and, and offering help or, or, you know, or not offering help. Um, the photos that you're showing right here from this article I recently wrote on these so-called cyclone houses in Vanuatu. And what I'd said, and I'll just say it again, is that the, I became interested in this by learning about um, the work that these uh, botanists from the New York Botanical Garden have been doing and continue to do in Vanuatu in Southwestern Pacific, <clears throat> where they've come from New York and they're working with local people um, to learn from them and to do what they can to assist in, in documenting traditional knowledge. And um, the, the people in Vanuatu are they're seeing the value of their knowledge. It's, you know, it was starting to fade away to some degree for various reasons, including the rise of tourism, um, just the development of the economy into a more of a kind of a, a Western style um, monetary or money-based economy. And people were starting to kind of drift away. And after these big cyclones hit Vanuatu, Cyclone Pam in 2015 and Cyclone Harold. I think it was last year um, when they in these houses, which you see on the screen there, um, when they rode through these devastating cyclones and these um, incredible traditional houses withstood the force of the cyclone, people really it drove home the point that, hey, uh, there's something really valuable here in our traditional knowledge. Um, and this is a complicated knowledge, even if it's not using, um, you know, the kind of equipment that we find in computers and, and other high-tech equipment. It's using traditional ways of, of braiding and cutting bamboo and weaving things and treating roots, for example. In the article I talk about, they take these specific roots of certain plants from the forest. And obviously you need to know which root, you need to know how to harvest it, when to harvest it. And then treating these roots, whether it's curing them in seawater for X amount of time, or it's heating them over fire to soften them and then tying them in certain ways around a wooden post and tying them when the, when the root itself is warm. And then as the root cools, it kind of tightens up and it becomes so strong, it's stronger than any nail. These are houses which uh, they look kind of, you could say primitive from the outside, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's looking at it the wrong way because these are incredible structures. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it. Goes back to preserving indigenous knowledge and uh, and it it, the respect it also for it. it also ties into uh, maintaining diverse forests because in the article you talk about they use certain ferns and certain parts of certain trees which are not in the quickly mass produced coconut groves or palm groves that they're right. trying. Plant more of. They need it only from the older diverse forest. So it also talks about the need to preserve these ancient forests, that there's so much value there, not just mm -hmm. for tradition and culture, of course, and their own heritage, but also for making these structures, which are so much better than the modern buildings. 
that they have. You you talk about in the article it the cyclone Pam displaced sixty five thousand people and damaged seventeen thousand buildings. But these traditional dwellings remained, and they were mm -hmm. fine. So if you want to survive, we have to go back to learning what these traditional strategies were, which are actually better than our modern mm -hmm. ways. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. And those might be, you know, if you, if you think out to the future, to 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, it might be the people in Vanuatu, for example, who are the ones that are thriving more than the people in, in you know, Honolulu or Hiroshima or Tokyo or New York, where we're so dependent on these other forces to, for our food, for our everything. Um, whereas these people are really self-sufficient and they know how to you know, ride out a cyclone, which uh, they're being threatened by potentially more and more as the years ahead come. Um, they're the ones that know how to grow their own food. They're the ones that know how to go into the forest and catch a bird or catch a, a you know an animal or, or raise pigs um, for food or go into the ocean and, and know what fish to catch and when. Um, and they're they're dependent upon themselves. Um, they're it seems to me more likely to to ride out some big collapse or, you know, God forbid, there's <laughs> nuclear weapons are used. I mean, in that case, that's an that's another story. But um, the the threats we're facing. You know, one interesting thing <clears throat> about COVID um, about Vanuatu is that they essentially have no COVID there. Um, they've, they've, they're one of the few countries that's managed to keep it out. They, you know, in March of 2020, they shut their borders and, um, they, they may have had one or two cases, but they've kept it under control. Like nobody, like very few other places have. That's amazing. There's so much, there's so much knowledge that we can learn and apply to our lives to be make our modern lives more resilient by resurrecting some of these amazing gems of information from the past. If we are humble enough to accept that we don't know everything and indigenous mm -hmm. people might know things which are really valuable even for our lives. It takes a different kind of mindset, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you see it again and again in different parts of the world. Definitely. I love this story, and it was, it was so beautifully written, John. What a great story. And it transitions so nicely into your Hawaiian fish pond story that you did many years ago, but it's so relevant and so worth talking about. Um, can you give us a little bit of the background about the Hawaiian traditions of the fish ponds? Sure. Um, aquaculture is, uh, has, has been a, a, an important part of Hawaiian culture for many centuries, and the Hawaiians are known for their, their um, technological skills, just as the people in Vanuatu have these amazing skills in building these structures and many other things. Um, Hawaiians are and continue to be you know, very skilled in building these fish ponds. And so I was on the big island, um, Hawaii Island, in 2018, actually doing some uh, reporting on military bases. And um, part of that was, of course, talking to people who are from the big island and, and others, people who are residents and native Hawaiians. And I connected with uh, one young native Hawaiian woman named Ruth, and she's uh, a leader um, in building, there's Ruth, uh, she's a leader in building these fish ponds um, or building one particular fish pond and helping revive it. And she's leading a, a hui or a group um, of members of the community who come together periodically or maybe it's once a month or a couple times a month. And they've taken these traditional sites and they've rebuilt these walls and they've They've cleared out the invasive species and tried to, you know, revive the fish pond. These are, there are many different kinds of fish ponds, but the particular fish pond, Coloco fish pond, which I wrote about, um, is built right by the sea and it has uh, stone walls and they have these sluice gates that allow small fish to enter and the fish can feed and then the small fish can go out and they can grow up. 
And the, the bigger fish, if they linger long enough, they become large enough that they can be eaten. Um, that's part of the goal. But it's it's more than just a place to grow or raise fish. Um, it's, you know, protecting the environment that is in that area. So you see the birds there that's a feeding ground for birds and all these other animals that it would gather there. And it's also a place for people to come together and, you know, share their their culture, their knowledge, their community. And uh, it's just a, it's a really nice um, positive story and really great work. Um, and that's one of, at the time, this is 2018, um, I think I spoke with one gentleman named Kevin Chang, and I think he told me there was something in an area of around 40 different restoration sites around the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah, there may be see. more, there may be fewer. Yeah, you say that in the the article, um, they're trying to revive or bring back, restore these ancient uh, fish ponds, which they mm -hmm. think has such a long history. Over 400 ponds used to be active around right. the Hawaiian islands. Right. And in 1893, this is from your article, which I will link below. People can go and read for themselves. It's a beautiful article. Um, Native Hawaiians lost control of their lands in 1893, and these 400 plus ponds around the islands started to fall into disrepair. And when I volunteered at a, a lo'i, at a traditional uh, Hawaiian taro plantation at University of Hawaii in Oahu, they were also talking about this idea that the traditional Hawaiian ways were very sustainable. And when you compare it to the Japan, Japanese traditional ways of using satoyama and the idea of the natural flows of water from the mountains through mm -hmm. agriculture, through the fish ponds out to sea and cleaning the water on the way out while you're creating food, there's so many wonderful connections to sustainability and what we want to create in our modern world, that these are ancient legacies, which we definitely want to revive and bring back. It's so many beautiful connections to our modern lives here. It's so wonderful to see this example. Um, another thing she was talking about in the article, um, she said they're growing seaweed at the base. So the combination of fresh Sea, sea water and fresh water from the mountain, that brackish water is really a perfect environment for the fish. They bring in the small fish and grow them till they're a good size. And mm -hmm. then those are mm -hmm. the bigger fish are the ones that they use for food and they let the smaller fish grow. So they're not overfishing. Everything is kind of kept in a balance. They're fighting invasive species, trying to keep more natural like traditional plants and traditional species. Oh my gosh, I wanna learn so much from, from these people, but even the people who have revived it now are trying to learn because a lot of the knowledge has kind of been lost, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's the same thing you see all over the world, just different influences come in, people are, you know, enamored with, with some new introduction and people are pulled away whether it's by choice or not, and uh, priorities change, and and then knowledge is lost, and and if it's not, if some, if nobody maintains it, it's just like a language or a, a skill. Um, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? And so, uh, fortunately, in Hawaii, as you know, having lived here for a long time, um, there are a lot of people who are, and fortunately, because of this. Um, this kind of renaissance of Hawaiian culture from the 1970s that's really gained strength and really um, taken on a life of its own. Fortunately, there are a lot of people who are really invested in, in um, perpetuating, you know, th these skills, this knowledge and taking um, a lot of pride in it and, and raising it to a level that hopefully um, interests people who are maybe not from that culture, but, learn about it and then they they take an interest and they can either support it or you know at least not cause damage to it or recognize when something does cause damage 
whether it's industrial pollution or development, which is a huge issue um, in Hawaii with, with tourism, um, the militarization of the islands, all these things pose a potential threat. But there are, there are many people who are standing up. I mean, and it goes, it goes from Mauka to Makai, from the, from the sea to the, to the top of the volcanoes, to Mauna Kea, you know. There, there was a great uh, conversation on the Ocean Impact Organization, which is an Australian-based organization, but they interviewed a famous surfer from Hawaii who has now gone back to the Big Island, and he is trying to recreate these traditional fish ponds and, and help the local communities to kind of regain their heritage and, and do things in a sustainable way. But because the podcast is focused on the oceans, it also brings in a lot of pollution from plastic pollution from other countries, which comes into Hawaii. And they were talking about the Hawaiian islands being kind of a catch point for the Pacific garbage patch of plastics. And so a lot of plastic is coming onto these beautiful, pristine Hawaiian beaches. And so it's another thing like we talked about before with the indigenous people around the world, there is no border for these kinds of problems, right? And then mm -hmm. another thing that you mentioned in this article is these beautiful fish ponds are also suffering from pollution from military exercises or chemical uh, companies on the island. So there's so much that needs to be done. It's not just about giving them back the rights to this land area, right? It's like what's mm -hmm. coming from the outside of the area because it's not really stopped by any kind of border, right? It's very right. complicated. Right. Somebody drops the, the styrofoam cup or a lighter or the rubber slipper or sandal off the boat or off the pier. It floats. It, you know, you look at some of the small islands that, that we never see or hear about. I'm thinking of the northwestern Hawaiian islands. You know, I'm on Kauai, which is the north northwesternmost um, large inhabited island. And then you've got Nihau and you've got Nihoa and Necker and you've got all these, all the way up to Kureatal, you've got these very small islands, reefs, and shoals. Um, some of these, what should be pristine feeding habitat for birds and sharks and monk seals and other forms of life, um, those, a lot of those very small, rarely seen islands, the beaches, the scientists who go there and work there report, you know, just incredible amounts of trash uh, washing up and, and just covering. And, you know, it's been well documented. If you, if you ever get a chance, Joy, there's a book, and if you haven't seen it, look for it. It's hard to get it, uh, your hands on, but it's called Remains of a Rainbow. Remains of a Rainbow. That title comes from William S. Merwin, a famous poet who passed away three, two years ago. Anyway, Remains of a Rainbow is a book of photography by uh, David Litschweger and Susan Middleton two wonderful photographers who um, documented um, the, the plants, the animals, the rare plants and animals of the Hawaiian islands. And then they went on to, um, Susan, I believe, went on to write a book called Archipelago. And she goes to the north, northwestern Hawaiian islands and looks at these the life forms, the beautiful life forms in the sea and the coast um, at the, just the natural beauty of these, but also the threat that they face from, you know, mostly it's plastic. It's just, it's human garbage that winds up in their bellies. And I'm sure you could probably see almost identical problems in, in islands in parts of Japan. Definitely. Yeah. And we do, we do monthly cleanups and a big issue in the Hiroshima area is from the oyster industry. And like the fish ponds, oysters thrive in the brackish waters. So the fresh and the sea, sea water together is perfect conditions. And oysters are great because they're actually cleaning the water, just like seaweed, just like a lot of other natural things. But the industry is using so much of these plastic tubes. And I know people in Hawaii who do beach cleanups are finding them. And so 
you know, what we can do even in Japan, even in our local area, has a positive or negative, if we don't do it, knock on effect on the rest of the world, including your islands, you know, beautiful islands in Hawaii. So it's right. it really all of your articles um, really remind me of this interconnectivity that we have around the world, that there is no borders for indigenous rights and culture and traditions that we need to preserve and educate each other on, as well as our climate change issues, our pollution issues, our military issues. So I really appreciate all the wonderful research and writing that you're doing, John. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thanks for taking an interest. It's um, I, I like writing these stories um, because I think they're interesting and they're important. And um, often I, I think that they're kind of underreported. You know, I try to look for stories that I think are not getting the attention they should uh, be getting, whether it's indigenous rights or environmental issues or um, the threat from nuclear weapons. So uh, thank you for taking an interest. Yeah, your all of your articles, all of your writing is so important and so wonderful, um, but very heavy. How do you find a way to balance and to go and enjoy your life and not take things too seriously? Because we don't we yeah. don't want you to burn out, right? How do you yeah, find a balance? Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, that's that's true, and I think about that. You know, sometimes it's like. You know, I read depressing stuff. I write depressing stuff. It's it's depressing, uh, but at the same time, I you know one one thing is that I, it sounds kind of silly or cliched, but and say oh it's empowering, but but it is kind of empowering. You know, when you're writing something about like if I see something that I think is a gross injustice, like damn this is really messed up in a big way. So if I can actually write about it and get people to maybe care, even if they don't have the power to change it immediately, at least say, shine a light on it and say, look, this situation is happening. It is, it is wrong. You know, this is so, there's something seriously wrong here and nobody's talking about it. So that kind of, even though it's a depressing subject, it gives kind of empowers me or makes me feel like at least I'm doing something. I hope it's having some positive influence Maybe it's changing people's minds. Maybe it's people who never thought about it, and at least now they're thinking about it. So that kind of gives me a little jolt of energy, a little bit. And the other thing is that, um, and I think we talked about this on Twitter, is that I work at a botanical garden part-time. It's an uh, non environmental nonprofit. And so I do a lot of writing about nature um, for that botanical garden. So I'm writing about plant conservation. I'm writing about um, saving endangered species. So it's kind of a balance between writing about really heavy military stuff or nuclear weapons and then writing about saving a rare plant so that the, the two kind of balance each other out a little bit. So that's one way. Yeah. And that's so important. Uh, where do you see like rays of hope? Where where do you see, I mean, you, you talk about so much progress with indigenous uh, people taking back lands and doing things traditional ways. Um, do you see it coming from education or is it policy or is it grassroots activism? Like where is the momentum, where is the change happening that you're seeing around you or in these stories? Where's the, I, I'm not sure if I caught the whole question, but where do I see the change? What's so What's where's where's, this, uh, where's the hope? Like where should we hope, invest uh, in? Is it is it all of them together in combination, or yeah. should we invest most of our time and energy in changing policy from the top down, or is it supporting grassroots organizations? Is it education? Where is yeah. it that we uh, we need I to mean, work on? You know, uh, it's I mean, there's so many huge serious issues right now and and it, you know people have said it before you you can't focus on everything you can't follow everything you can't do you can't solve everything so maybe the one way is to to focus on well, where's your passion what is it you know is it environmental justice is it um in, in indigenous issues is it uh, finding a more sustainable way to live is it how to grow your own food is it fighting um, injustice in one form or another and if you, I think if you focus on one or two areas that, you know, whatever your capacity is, just focusing on that and just 
paying attention. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's there are lots of things that people can be distracted by, um, and maybe that's the right thing for some people. But I think rather than be distracted by things that are, you know, I, I don't want to say they're not important, but you know, what it, it, I guess each person has to decide for themselves what is what are their priorities and what is important, and then just focusing on that and realizing, okay, there's 35 issues here, and I can't deal with all of them, but I'm going to focus on these two things or these, whatever it is, three things and just stay focused on that. And there's so much good information out there. There's so much, you know, people talk about fake news, people and the, and the people, conspiracy theories and QAnon and all this crazy stuff. And yeah, that is a huge problem. It's a massive problem in the United States and elsewhere. Um, but at, if you, if you're serious, there's a lot of great information. It's, you know, it's accessible thanks to technology we're able to connect with people like never before we're able to get information that was harder to get than before we're able to get information in real time i mean if you take the time to to actually you know vet some of this stuff for yourself and say is this a legitimate source of information is it trustworthy um and if if you believe it is you know follow it up by by checking other sources but it's there so it's not like we it's not like we can't do anything it's not like just watching television and learning about this issue and saying oh that's terrible hmm, too bad there's actually things we can do now like you're doing with your show um whether it's you're writing something or you're connecting with people or you're joining a group or you're making a group or you're you're you know lots of young people are finding ways to create a, a, a system or a, a product that can help other people you know, there's all kinds of stories out there about people doing that. Uh, an eight-year-old kid or a 10-year-old kid who designs a prosthetic leg that can help um, landmine survivors in Southeast Asia or whatever it is. There's all different things that we can be doing now. So I would just say focus on whatever your where your passion is and then pursue it. Um, I don't that's, know. <laughs> that's great. No, that's great advice. And that goes back to like the entrepreneurial inspiration, right? Like most successful entrepreneurs, they start with a need that they have personally. And then they try to fix that need. And then lo and behold, a lot of people have that need and they're supplying something that a lot of people want. And I think what you're talking about is, is very similar, right? You see a need in your personal situation, in your community, in your life, and you try to find a way to address that, whether that's through writing or talking or activism or starting a business, right? And put that energy to good use. And probably there's other people that will respond positively to that and support you and, and make it a success. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, technology has enabled us to to get a hold of a lot of information and, and make connections that we that was a lot harder to do even 20 years ago. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> just go for it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, John. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties, but I am inspired by all of your writing. Every time I read your articles, I find rays of hope in there, even though they're very serious issues. They're issues that we need to talk about, that we need to shine a light on. So I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Joy. I appreciate you taking the time and interest in the stories and um, taking the time to talk with me. It's fun to talk with you and I appreciate it. Um, so I hope we can talk again soon. Yeah, I hope so. Well, like I mentioned in the beginning, you have so many articles that we didn't even get a chance to touch on. Um, so hopefully we can have you back in a few months time and discuss some more. Thank you so much. Okay, enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you, you too. Okay. Thank you everybody okay. for Bye -bye. joining today. Please take care. And our next talk is this Wednesday. We're talking with Dave Shulman, who is talking about renewable energy in Japan. So please join us again. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.